Perhaps the first thing we notice regarding this synthesis is that we are beginning with a reagent that contains two carbons, but our final product contains six carbons. So of course we have to find a way to add four total additional carbons onto our starting reagent. And what we're going to do is actually begin by examining a couple of reagents from this pool. And one of those reagents is this very strong base known as sodium amide. And then another reagent that's going to come in handy is this reagent here. So this is basically ethyl iodide. Now why are these reagents going to be useful to us? Well, let's take a look at what we're starting with. A very simple alkyne. And if we add the reagent sodium amide first, what we want to do is understand that this is an ionic compound, so the sodium has a positive charge and the amide is a negatively charged ion. And the amide ion is a very strong base. It has a lone pair on the nitrogen. And what happens is that very strong base is able to deprotonate the terminal hydrogen here on the alkyne. So it's basically going to rip that hydrogen off. These two electrons here will stay with the carbon. So what we end up forming is a negative acetylide ion. Basically, it's a triple bonded carbon that contains a negative charge on it. And so that's the result of treating our alkyne with that strong base. Then we said it would be useful to include the ethyl iodide, but why is that? Well, let's take a look. Let's draw the ethyl iodide. We have a CH3 bonded to a CH2 and then bonded to an iodide. Iodide is a very good leaving group. So this sets us up for a classic SN2 reaction where the negatively charged carbon will attack that carbon right there. The reason it attacks that carbon is because it's bonded to the very electronegative iodine. That gives that carbon right there a little bit of positive charge because basically its electrons are being tugged away from it. So that's why we attack there. And then at the same time, the iodide will leave. So what ends up happening, if we kind of come down maybe over here, is we add these extra two carbons to the molecule. So we might color them to emphasize that. We are bonded to the CH2 followed by the CH3, and then the iodide has left. So this is nice because now instead of having two carbons on our molecule, we have a total of four. And so you might guess, well, since we need a grand total of six, we would run this reaction again. And that's exactly right. So if we do this two-step mechanism again, where we add the sodium amide and then the ethyl iodide. What's going to happen is this terminal hydrogen over here will be removed, will form the lone pair of electrons and a negative carbon there, and that's going to come over and attack at that same carbon, and the iodide is going to leave again. So what ends up happening is that we place an additional two carbons on the left side of the molecule kind of color them differently here to emphasize that they are different carbons. And so after four steps, one, two, three, four, we have achieved a six carbon molecule. So that's really good. We're getting there. But of course, we need to create a ketone. We have to somehow introduce a double bond to oxygen within the molecule and also lose the triple bond. So it doesn't seem like that that's feasible, but we recall in this chapter that we have learned about a hydration reaction involving these reagents right here. So you have water, sulfuric acid, and then this mercury to sulfate. So let's go down below. Now this is a mechanism you probably don't need to know. Most textbooks sort of just explain the process in passing. What you really need to know is the outcome. So let's talk about the outcome. These reagents are going to be used to hydrate a triple bond. Now hydrate simply means to add a hydrogen at one carbon and an OH at the other carbon of the triple bond. Now in this case, we have a symmetrical alkyne. This is very important for us to understand. So it doesn't really matter, so to speak, whether we add the hydrogen to this carbon and the OH to that carbon or vice versa. And the reason again is because this is a symmetrical alkyne. So let's choose the case that we just drew. So what we're going to have here, if we kind of redraw it, is a CH3, CH2. We're going to give that carbon the hydrogen. The neighboring carbon is going to get the OH group. And then we have the CH2, CH3 here. Now the triple bond is no longer a triple bond in this case, because if it were, you would have carbons that possess five bonds. So what happens is it's reduced down to a double bond. 
But this molecule is actually very unstable. This is what we call an ene all. Ene because it contains a double bond, and all because it has a hydroxyl group in it. And an enol is an unstable molecule. So again, you probably learned in this chapter that an enol will actually rearrange, or if you want to be fancy, it will tautomerize. And it will tautomerize or rearrange into a ketone in this case. So basically what happens is this double bond, you can sort of think of it as coming up here to form a double bond right there. And then this hydrogen will migrate over to that carbon there. That is certainly not the mechanism, but that's basically the end result. It's sort of the punchline of the rearrangement. So what happens is you end up with that carbon that had that hydrogen. And then as we said, the hydrogen of the hydroxyl sort of migrates over to that carbon here. That pi bond, you can think of it as migrating upward. So you're going to form to color code it a little bit, you're going to form it right there. There's your oxygen. And then you have the CH2, CH3. So in essence, we are left with the product. If we write this in a skeletal structure, we have the six carbons. And then at this carbon here, we have the double bond to oxygen. So that does work. I hope you notice that if we were to do this the other way, this is a very important point, that if we back up and instead of putting the hydrogen and the OH there, we sort of reversed it. We noted that that wouldn't matter because it's a symmetrical alkyne. But let's understand why that doesn't matter. So you would form this initially, it would tautomerize or rearrange. And when it rearranges, in that case, you would end up with the double bond to oxygen here and the hydrogen there. But notice this is the same molecule. This is still one, two, three, four, five, six carbons long. And at the third carbon, if we number it in that fashion, you have the carbonyl group. So we would have the six carbons and then you would have your carbonyl group here. It might look different, but it's the same thing. Again, you still have the carbonyl group at carbon three, just like we had the carbonyl group over here at carbon three. So that's why this synthesis works, because whether you add the H and the OH in this fashion or in reverse fashion, as we did earlier, you're still going to get basically three hexanone is basically the name of that molecule. And so let's go back and just put into the answer boxes what we discovered here. So step one was the sodium amide. Step two was the ethyl iodide. Then we did a second round of that. So we had step three, sodium amide again. Then we had the ethyl iodide. And then finally, we had added those reagents in green here that hydrated the triple bond. And there is indeed the answer.